Good afternoon, everybody. Today is November 23rd. Welcome to the Montpelier Planning Commission meeting. Uh, does everybody have a copy of the agenda? Um, this is a call to order. Uh, first order of business is the approval of the agenda. Any comments or anything? Uh, I'd ask for unanimous consent to approve uh, the agenda, unless anybody says anything. Hearing nothing, the agenda is approved. Uh, next is comments from the chair. I don't have any. Um, next is general business. That's comments from the public or anything else not on the agenda. Do we have anybody from the public here? Sounds like we don't. Does anybody want to talk about anything that's not on the agenda? Nope. Okay, moving on. Next is considering the minutes of our last meeting on November 9th. Uh, Mike sent a copy of the minutes. It might take a minute to review them. I just looked at them, so I move approval of the minutes. Okay, Adrian has moved approval of the minutes. Uh, Do we have concerns about typos? <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of given up on that. If okay. you, well, if you send me typos, I can always go and make the changes. You know, we can approve as amended with the typos okay. corrected if you've got them. Did you have some, Stephanie? Yeah, the second paragraph um, under the city plan update, the second sentence, it should read two of the top goals are that public <laughs> transportation will be more available. Yeah. All right. Okay. And I had a question about the first paragraph, just to, to clarify. Um, was it true that the committee didn't set a goal of reducing the number of cars in the city? Was that actually kind of a, a negative goal on their part? Do you remember? I think we talked about that in the context of whether they had specific benchmarks and they didn't have a specific benchmark for that. Okay, but they didn't specifically say we don't want to reduce the number of vehicles. <laughs> no, good. they just didn't have us. They just didn't come up with a specific number. I think okay, I think they didn't think good. that would be a good benchmark. Didn't they tell? Didn't I thought they said that that wasn't getting at the the goal anyways. Yeah, well, one of the problems will be we can't meet the energy requirement, energy plan, if we don't reduce the number of vehicles somehow. So anyway, but we'll worry about that later. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, with those changes in mind, Ariane has moved for approval of the minutes. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Great. The uh, minutes are approved. Uh, next on the agenda is an update on the on review record or on the record review for DRB hearings and a uh, report from the DRB chair and vice chair. All right. Well, I sent out um, a we met, um, Meredith and I met with um, Kate and Kevin, um, Kate McCarthy and uh, Kevin O'Connell, who are the chair and vice chair of the development review board to talk about what you and I, what we had all talked about, which was the adoption of MAPA, the Ad Municipal Administrative Procedures Act and also known as on the record review and uh, a quick summary for uh, anyone who forgot what this was all about or is a member of the public and listening to this um, on the record review changes how we would run the development review board hearings um, making them a little bit more formal and in doing so it would um, make appeals of any development review board 
applications, uh, if you were to make an appeal to environmental court, it would be reviewed what is called on the record as opposed to being reviewed de novo. And what that means is um, the way things are right now is it is a de novo review, which means as new. So when somebody appeals, let's say the, the parking garage, it goes to the, the judge in the environmental court and they will review the hearing. They will review the whole um, application again. Um, now they generally do try to limit the scope because they don't want to go and hear the entire application all over again. So they usually work to, to limit the scope of the appeal, but the judge is not bound by anything that any decision that was made by the development review board, it is heard anew. Um, and so it becomes a much bigger, a uh, much bigger process. And if, um, an interested person does not agree with the decisions that the development review board made, they could basically get another bite at the apple by going to the environmental court and hearing the case anew with them. Um, what the shift to on the record review does is makes that appeal to environmental court on the record, which means the environmental court is going to take the video that is used for the development review board meetings and will review the video and, and the transcripts of that hearing and look at the material and, and determine whether or not the development review board did their job correctly. So it's, it's, a, it's a subtle difference, but it's a critical difference. So in other words, in, instead of looking at the evidence to decide whether or not um, the application should or should not be approved, the judge is actually looking to see if everything was appropriately handled and managed at the development review board level. Um, so it's a different, it's a completely different process. And what it usually does is it helps to limit the number of, of appeals. So um, you, you generally may get less frivolous appeals because you can't get a second bite at the apple. You have to, if, if we do our jobs right, then you can only appeal for procedural things. Did we not appropriately warn or notice the hearing? Did we not um, admit evidence appropriately? Um, so it becomes a slightly more formal process. Um, and, and the people this affects the most are the appellants, first of all, or, or uh, you know, abutters to projects and the development review board themselves. And when we talked about it at the planning commission level, your conversation was that you thought it would be important to hear from the DRB and the DRC um, as to what their thoughts were. And it really doesn't affect the DRC design review committee as much as um, because they're, um, they're just advisory to the development review board. They don't actually have any permitting authority. They, they're advisory to either the administrative officer or the development review board. So um, we did just forward uh, and we talked to the chair and, the, and what you have is um, uh, what, what they put together was after our conversation was a, a list of some of their concerns that they had. Um, and I'll just read real quickly from the November 16th letter that Kate wrote um, that, you know, um, this has been considered on and off for years. And um, due to the cost of uh, expensive appeals, projects may find you know, people may find this desirable. Um, it's a way it has several zoning. And these comments are based on her seven years of experience on the DRB um, and a year and a half as, as, as vice chair and nine months now as chair. Um, first, she thought it seems like a very involved process for a very limited problem. And she notes that we have very few appeals in, in her seven years and her, her seven years actually overlap with my seven years here at the city. And she can remember only two, two appeals. There's the parking garage. And then there was an existing of a, of a, a permit that was settled out of court um, up on College Street. Um, so she didn't think for all of the additional effort that there was that much of a problem that needed to be solved. Um, 
and if anyone wants to, to jump in, uh, feel more than welcome, but um, I'll just go through these so that way members of the public can, can hear what were the concerns and then we can talk about them afterwards if you want. Um, the second complaint is a fair amount of training and support would be needed to implement MAPA and this could discourage participation um, on the DRB. So the concern is that we have a difficult time sometimes um, getting enough people to fill all of our boards and if somebody you know, watches a DRB hearing, they may kind of feel intimidated by the fact that this is so um, kind of legal and formal and they may feel that, that they shouldn't participate. Mike, did... Um... Um, or that they, they couldn't participate because of how it works. Yeah. In your discussions with Kate, did she point out any specific sort of procedural requirements under MAPA that was giving her concern? Because I just, I don't see her pointing out anything anything specific under MAPA that sort of gives rise to these concerns. It's just sort of the general broad brushstroke. Uh, she did not point to anything specific when we talked. Um, it was, and that was some of her things that she, um, she really didn't fully understand what would be involved in that. Um, and, and we talked from our end, um, Meredith is an attorney. And from my perspective, I'm not an attorney, but um, the thought was that we, you know, Meredith as an attorney, we may have to look when we hire zoning administrators, we may have to look at somebody who has some legal experience and that we may also have to appoint at least one person to the development review board who has a legal background. Now, historically, we've had folks like Phil Zallinger and Dan Richardson, who are both attorneys who very easily could have understood the requirements of um, the, the, the rules of procedure. Um, to, to properly make sure that we are handling our DRB meetings. And so whether that's the chair um, or whether it's somebody who gets appointed as say a parliamentarian who is just an attorney, maybe they get a stipend to sit on the DRB to, to make sure that we meet those requirements. So we, we talked about those as options so that way we would kind of take that out, but she still felt that the process would be um, slightly more um, formal and and and, um, and and I personally don't know the rules of procedure, so I don't know how easy or complicated they are. But um, the thought was that this was going to be more complicated than was necessary. Thanks, Mike. Is this something that it's it's all or nothing? I mean, could could it be requested by a very complex project? Or is it have to be all projects that would come under? It this? doesn't have to be all projects, but it can't be arbitrary as to which ones go through it. So different communities have different standards. In some cases, they'll say only projects with conditional use, or we might, for example, say that only projects that are major site plans um, will go through this process, or some communities will say only Act 250 projects will go through. Um, so it's, it's slightly it. depends. Uh, we could limit it. And we did talk about that with, the, with them. Uh, so the third point was um, this could frustrate participation in DRB hearings in general, not just for the more controversial cases. Um, So this was just a sense that, that some people may be intimidated, and this could be neighbors or abutters or somebody else could be intimidated um, by the fact that this is a slightly more formal process. Um, and, you know, in, in a community where, we, where we're trying to strive for inclusion and equity, that making a process slightly more formal um, is just going to perhaps lead to more people who don't want to participate, even as, as a butters, because they just don't know when or how to participate in that process. 
I, I think some of that could be overcome. I don't think any of these things that are here are impossible to overcome, but these were certainly the concerns that she had and, and certainly things we should keep in mind as, as we're thinking about it is that, you know, making, making a more legal process. If we've, if anyone has ever been put into a situation where you're, you're going to court or you have to get in a more legal situation, you, it does feel more intimidating. You don't know when you're allowed to speak up or, or how to participate. And you feel like you might need an attorney to represent you when that's really not the case. Um, so the fourth thing they talked about was the adoption of MAPA could undermine the city's ongoing efforts of inclusion. Again, this was this relates to number three. Formalizing the hearing process could make it more intimidating and less accessible to everybody. Um, five, it seems likely that for projects uh, to which people are fiercely opposed, the appeals would simply shift to being procedural appeals. Um, so the sense was that while we have to well, sometimes the sense might be, you know, well, this, this will help cut down on, on some NIMBY type appeals. If somebody has an attorney and wants to appeal, um, they could file a whole bunch of complaints on, you know, um, in, in the earlier steps, they might go through and, and turn what is what is more of a um, citizen board. Um, into having somebody come in and say, I'm an attorney, and um, in the first thing, I want to depose any, any you know, as, as the neighbor, as the attorney for the neighbor, I want to depose all of the applicants, witnesses, before we get into this process, and really turn what is a citizen review into a very formal, um, you know, and basically slow down the process by saying, I want to depose everybody who's putting in evidence, I want to be able to file appeals and, and make uh, uh, claims on whether people can or can't um, provide testimony or um, questioning that testimony or providing cross-examination and really kind of um, turn the process, which is usually driven by the chair, into a process that's driven by two attorneys beating each other up back and forth over whether something is inappropriate or inappropriate and do we end up with 10, 10 hearings to get through what we used to get done in three hearings um, because we have to have a whole bunch of formalities just because somebody decides um, their best approach to winning is by slowing down the process and beating things up. And so their, their sense was the, the, it's not going to necessarily take away the appeals. The appeals are going to be appeals of the DRB should have considered this. You need to remand this back to the DRB. And the DRB hears the hearing, and then it goes back up to the environmental court where they say, well, but the DRB didn't do this, and they should have allowed us to question the testimony of this, and, and that's not appropriate, and it gets kicked back down. So that they felt it wasn't, although the goal was to let's remove the appeals, it's just going to be different appeals was their, their opinion. So question. Oh, go ahead, Marcella. Thanks. Um, Mike, is there, do you see a lot of currently the e-court um, remanding stuff back to the DRB? They usually don't because most of them don't end up, um, most, most don't go back um, because they're de novo hearings. So you don't get remanded back if it's a de novo. Um, I don't know of a lot of on the record ones. I know um, in talking to um, Sarah McShane, who was our zoning administrator before Meredith, uh, Sarah went on to work for Stowe, and she gets appealed all the time. She said she's always getting appealed. They're always going to back up the court, and they're an on-the-record community. So um, from the standpoint of, well, this will cut down on appeals, that certainly is not the case that Stowe finds. In, in, her, in her experience, I mean, to the extent that you feel comfortable sharing it or having it, um, do you have a sense of whether she feels that on the record review has been helpful in, in Stowe with all that litigation or not? I would have to, I think she kind of have to speak for herself. I think, I think there's a mix of both. It, it has its pluses and it has its minuses. If you're doing it to avoid appeals, I think she would probably say it, it hasn't 
avoided the appeals on her case. Now it, it just changes the dynamics. Um, in Stowe, it's a little bit different community, which we talked about with Kate and um, and Kevin in that um, there are a lot of people from other states. There are a lot of second homeowners. There are a lot of people who are from states that are very much used to, you just hire an attorney and you go back to the DRB and you fight everything out. Um, and that's not historically the way Montpelier has been. Montpelier has always been more of a community um, of, of folks and a citizen board. And, and we don't get a lot of projects where attorneys show up at, at hearings. Uh, you know, it does happen from time to time, but um, usually though it's, you know, um, you know, my brother-in-law is an attorney and he shows up or, or um, you know, those types of attorneys, not necessarily hiring somebody to, to fight it unless it's a big project like the parking garage or Saban's pasture or um, in, in which case those, those are ones where groups will come together and, and appeal the project. Did this come up in the first place because of the parking garage? Was the idea that this process might have helped that run more smoothly? So this has been around for a long time. It's actually in the 2009 um, master plan that we've readopted. Um, it was identified back back in those days. And I think it, it dates back to even before then that there was a discussion that um, from time to time projects get backed up, you know, 2006, the Saban Pasture Project. And um, sometimes these get knocked off the rails because of neighborhood opposition and maybe if we had a more formal process we could be doing and making these decisions comes up is once it leaves our drb and it goes as a de novo hearing to the e-court it's somebody who may not have any um, familiarity with montpelier and the values here and they're going to make a decision based on their opinions and um, as opposed to having something that comes out of the municipality um, where we, we make the decisions for our community. Um, you know, once it gets appealed up, that's out of our hands and it's a, you know, an outside person who's going to make that decision of whether or not that zoning permit gets appealed. And um, I think that's, you know, that's on the one side of why you want to do MAPA, but at the same time, is it, is it worth it? It's always been a conversation though, to answer the question. It, it's been here since I came here, it's been a priority. It's actually on this, this city council's um, strategic plan to explore adopting MAPA um, because they're just trying to make sure that um, we aren't getting unnecessary barriers put in the way of housing project. It wasn't necessarily, it wasn't actually at all about the parking garage. The parking garage just makes a good example. Um, Mike, yeah. given the fit, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say to Kate's first point, I mean, I think um, I, just because there haven't been a lot of appeals, I mean, I know projects have not gone forward because they're worried about getting appealed. So, I mean, that's just another consideration that to think about, but I do, you know, I'm, I'm, I think her other concerns are, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, but just on that first point, I wanted to say that. It, it seems like given the fact that then it doesn't become a de novo, um, appeal it seems as if it could simplify things or at least shorten the process yes it might get sent back to the drb but in some ways that's a more accessible board for local participation um even though it's you know perhaps only going back because of a procedural issue uh it just seems, seems as if it could simplify the appeal process but I also think I, when we talked about I mean, the, in the, general, the first time, I've, no, go ahead, Stephanie. Sorry. When we talked about this the first time, I think where we landed is that we wanted input from the DRB so that we could better understand the issue. Um, and this seems like some pretty clear input to me coming from Kate that she's not interested. Um, I 
I, I think she definitely knows more about this than I do. So I respect that opinion and, and I, I know her, I respect her as a human. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think her perspective here makes me think that maybe this isn't the right time to do it, or maybe it doesn't make sense. I don't know that I'm hearing a lot of compelling reason to, to do it despite her comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I feel like maybe this isn't the right tool, but I, again, because I've just heard of projects that don't even, don't even try because they're worried about getting appealed. I mean, like, I think it's a very compelling, I, yeah, I think it's a problem in Montpelier. And um, I don't know, I wonder if there's a way to mitigate, I mean, I, I agree with you on Kate, I think she's brilliant. Um, and the fact that she doesn't want to do it is, is, is important, but I wonder if there's a way to mitigate the other concerns or have a conversation with her about other possibilities to work on this problem. Yeah, I definitely, I would agree that it's an issue in terms of people not well, I think I think the challenge is that it feels a little bit like if someone wants to kill a project in Montpelier, they'll kill the project. So I think that's that's the perception anyway. I don't know how often that actually happens, but I feel like that's the perception. It feels like if someone doesn't want it to go through, it won't. And I don't know if this specifically would prevent that. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. It's a perception, but when when resources are limited, you can't always test that perception. I mean, coming from, you know, thinking about nonprofit housing organizations and um, such, but, um, and then I lost my train of thought, but I, I, yeah, whether it's a perception or reality, it's sometimes you can't afford to test that. Yeah, so I'm saying at, at a minimum, it's a perception. I think it's yeah. likely a reality too, yeah. <laughs> Likely a reality, yeah. yeah. I mean, my other concern is is the kinds of appeals that happen very late in the game, and that's uh, that's what I would hope that something like this might be able to forestall. You know, people who don't get into the appeal until way way into the process, and I think that's not fair to the applicant. Um, and then, and uh, I, we've seen that happen before. Yeah, and I think with with resources, I think there are ways to address, um, you know, if there was a desire to move forward and there was a uh, concern about certain issues, I think there are ways of addressing those concerns. Again, um, I think the board would, or the council would have to, in my opinion, appoint uh, um, somebody who is either partaining non-voting or a member to the DRB who is an attorney who would be basically the parliamentarian to help them go through um, and to meet those requirements. I don't think we can expect it. Um, the times I've been in support of this in the past have been times, as I said, when when we had, you know, really top-notch attorneys that have been on the board and, and we've had a turnover and we now, you know, don't have attorneys on, on our DRB. It's a much more diverse board, um, so it, it does present that that question of okay, how do we deal with those? Um, how do we tackle the the issue of um, in, being inclusive or having people feel um, outside? There, you know, there may have to be somebody who is um, available to provide assistance to to people who are butters. I mean, they're not members of the board. Um, you know, maybe they're, they're um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of what the legal term would be, but you know, just, there's just somebody who, who works to pro bono help comment. There's somebody there who can go through and say, okay, um, you know, I can, I can let you know when, when to provide comment or I can provide your comments for you if you don't feel by helping people provide testimony without feeling like they're 
they're being excluded from the process because they, they don't understand how it works or whatever. You, you'd have somebody there who'd be an agent to help them navigate the process. I, I think there are ways of, of getting around it if, if we wanted to have a more formal process. Um, Yeah, I just, if I can chime in uh, with a comment and then a question, you know, I can only speak from my experience. You know, I've been working in administrative law for my entire lawyer career. And, you know, I can say that providing this sort of framework, um, I think, has a lot of benefits to, you know, the DRB in terms of creating structure for how they render their decisions and I think for the appeal reasons that we've discussed. You know, the, one of the downs, I wouldn't even call it a downside, I think one of the, the burdens that the board would have to carry in order to do it, I think, uh, Mike, you hit the nail on the head, is, is, and this has happened, this has been part of my experience working in administrative law and various other places, is, yeah, you have to serve as sort of a public information resource for, um, you know, pro se people, you know, that want to participate in the process, but don't exactly know how to do it um you know but in my experience is once you've done it once or twice and i think anybody on the drb can gain this experience um you know then you have a good you, you, once the process is put in place and people have some experience with it it becomes pretty smooth and members of the board are able to provide that sort of general information to the public to help facilitate participation. That's just my that's just my experience. And I don't know how well it would translate to the DRB. Um, with that said, is I get the sense that a lot of kids' comments are sort of revolve around the concern that it might be overbroad to apply MAPA to all DRB cases. And so I think Barb, maybe you were the one that talked about it. Is is there a way to sort of identify the types of cases that might come before the DRB where this process might be more appropriate to apply. I don't know the answer to that at all. I don't have enough experience with this stuff to know, but if anybody here does have a kind of a better sense of when it might be more appropriate or more advantageous to apply those processes, you know, I think that might be one way to, to, to do that because I think at the end of the day, what applying MAPA or on the record review to these types of proceedings is, is it it dictates where the decision making process ultimately lies and you know, sort of you have to answer the question do you want it ultimately to you know when you, when you have a case that's contentious and there's you know litigants or you know the the applicant and abutting landowners and people with interests and other stakeholders really want to express those interests do they want to be able to articulate that to the board and have that be the primary decision maker or do you want to have the DRB function is almost sort of a perfunctory kind of first step to the ultimate, you know, resolution at the next appellate level. I, I think there's a lot of benefit to having, you know, the parties take the DRB very serious, take that process very seriously. And I think MAPA does that, notwithstanding the, the additional burdens that obviously are attendant with that. So uh that's just my comment the question i have is because it's been a while it's been long enough that i've forgotten enough about this is how are we involved in the decision making process in terms of whether or not we we do this and where do we fit into that dis decision making process and yeah that's basically it that's um yeah i would have to review the specific timing. Um, we had brought this up because we were doing another, uh, you know, adoption process, and we had the, you know, we've got the zoning bylaw window open, and do we include the 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 changes that would be necessary? Do we put them in this process into this adoption? There's a, a set of of changes, and Meredith went through and laid them out in her memo about. Um, all the things that have to happen. There's got to be a motion by the city council to adopt MAPA. Then we have to put those processes into our zoning regulations um, and then adopt the zoning regulations. And then there's a, like a follow-up step after everything is adopted to, to 
kind of go through that um, to implement and I, those I'm sorry, and if changes I remember, that have been put into the zoning. Sorry, if I remember correctly, Meredith had drafted some language with this, but hadn't really done a complete draft of it yet, right? Yeah, correct. So she went through and put together um, a bunch of it, but didn't go through and go any farther. The question is, all right, this is going to be a lot of work. Decide on on this first go, no go, um, and then we can move it to the next level and decide we want to drafting up the language. Can I add one one other thought? Um, I appreciate that she brought up um, the city's ongoing efforts at inclusion. I guess I wouldn't mind if we're going to do anything further. I wouldn't mind a little more conversation about that. I tend to not. I tend. Well, I I can see what she might mean by that. I'm also not sure that formalizing it will. I understand that there's like a learning curve and people would need to understand and may feel more intimidated, but I wonder if there might be some include some equity benefits from formalizing the process as well. So, because, I, and I don't really know exactly, I don't have more thoughts about this, but I just want to make sure we're not just thinking like, well, because it seems less friendly, therefore it's going to be, it's going to be exclusive. I want to make sure that's actually the case and that there wouldn't be equity benefits from creating something more formal, if that makes sense. Yeah, just, just to dovetail on that, again, I can only speak to my experience with these sorts of processes is, is pro creating that sort of framework, that formal framework around the process, I think in a lot of ways uh, democratizes, you know, the process a bit and because without the process, I've seen instances where sort of stakeholders come into the process that have concerns, but they just end up sort of shouting into the void. And there's, you know, there's no real sense of what their comments or participation means to anything. Whereas if, you know, once somebody comes into the process and there's a, there's a certain level of responsibility that, that, that participant, you know, has in the process, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a barrier, but I feel like it's fairly low. It's a pretty small barrier, but, you know, it's understood what that person's participation means in the process a little more. Um, yeah, and I think if we do have broader concerns as a city about public participation and equity issues, I think there's like a whole host of other things we could do to make sure people feel welcome and able to be heard. And I don't think just not taking this up is gonna really make that much of a difference. You know, I think there are, those would be very proactive efforts that would need to happen. Refreshments at the hearings, agreed. <laughs> I mean, honestly, childcare, <laughs> like, that, I mean, just like, yeah, the thing you said, Mike, about like having somebody sort of walk people through and understanding what the process is. I mean, that could easily be happening now. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to downplay it. I mean, I do get that coming into a, a more legal thing is intimidating. Um, I just don't want to unex go unexamined because I think the equity piece is really important. Yeah, and I agree. I think the the um, there are equity benefits in that one of the you know one of the arguments in favor of the the MAPA is that it, it um, you know it's it's meant to address some of the NIMBY concerns and some of the NIMBY concerns you know you know you're you're going to have your opportunity but you're not going to be able to appeal this to somebody else um, um, to have them decide it because you don't like the answer here. And sometimes those applications that have come in are applications um, that provide benefit. You know, we, we you know, uh, uh, you know, if neighbors don't want 
um, you know, a group home or affordable housing or um, multifamily housing, regardless um, of of the income, um, they may they may fight it, and those projects don't happen. Or as Ariane says, they they don't even bother applying because they don't think they'll ever get approved. And the the formalized process actually helps those disadvantaged applications get approved. Um, uh, but again, and if you you know, flip it over, if you've got a negative impacts on um, you know somebody decides to you know put a put I don't know, a, a waste transfer center on Barry Street because they feel that's going to be the easiest place to get it approved because people you know, are, are lower income and aren't going to be able to organize to fight it. Um, you know, in, in other communities around the country, that, that is precisely what happens. Uh, find, the, find the poor and plunk that, that use that nobody wants in there because the, the citizens aren't going to be able to organize to be able to defeat the project. And so that's where MAPA can work the other way and hurt the equity issue in that um, if you can't navigate the process and the bigger applicants can navigate the process, they may, you know, beat you up on the way through and simply get approved um, because they know how to, they know how to get approved and you don't know how to defeat it. Um, I don't know if that would happen. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. It's tricky. So uh, I guess next steps with respect to this issue, um, are we in a position to make a recommendation? Do we have a motion on anything or do we need to mull this over a little more? I mean, we can make a decision of you know, one of three choices, um, you know, the idea is still alive, the idea is dead, or the idea needs more, more conversation and, and discussion. What specifically would the, uh, the idea is alive next step be? Uh, I would probably sit down with Meredith and, and re-review her memo. It's been couple of months now and I can't remember offhand what the next step is if we go to city council to get approval before we draft language to put into the zoning or if we um, simply start putting stuff together to, to put in um, to put in this this zone this round of zoning adoptions it's starting to get a little late for this round of zoning adoptions I can see how quick it would we could put that together um, I think it depends whether or not we have to go to city council first um, one option is we, we put a packet together, we do our hearing at the planning commission level, we go to the city council and then have the city council vote at that point to go through and say, yes, we should go forward. And, and we've isolated all of the changes that are MAPA um, in, into one thing. So if you vote yes to go to MAPA, then that also means you're approving this slate. And if you vote at the city council no to MAPA, then that means all of these go away. But I'd have to talk to Meredith about how it works. I mean, maybe I'm being overly um, diplomatic, but it does. I do feel like we sh could we have a conversation with the DRB about it? Because I don't want to just like start, oh, let's do on the record review. And we just heard from the chair that they don't want to do it. Like, I'd like to talk to them a little bit more about it or see if we can come to a, you know, a more an understanding about how we could overcome some of these barriers. <laughs> we could certainly set up a joint meeting um, to try to set something up where we where we can have a conversation, a direct conversation between the two um, between the two commissions and boards, um, and do it that way. Um, it also may be helpful if. If we did that, um, that we try to find somebody who is familiar with MAPA, maybe even inviting in um, 
David Rue, who's our city attorney or somebody else to kind of go through and, you know, because there's a lot, just so much stuff. I, I, I've never done MAPA. So, um, so many times I can usually come in and give people my experience in, in, you know, in, in how I've handled things or seen things done, but I've never honestly had to do MAPA for any community that I work for. So, um, it may be helpful to have somebody there who has the experience or has the legal background to say, no, 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 you're, you're overdoing it. That that's not how this is going to happen. Um, it's, it, it's much less, it's, it's not that when we say it's more formal, it's not that formal or, Maybe they have a different opinion. I don't know. Yet. I mean, that sounds like a good next step to me, but I don't know what others think. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Stephanie that I don't want, or both of you, I don't want to like, if her letter is fairly strong, I don't want to, but so yeah, it may be nice. I I like the idea of inviting expert a couple, an expert or two, and maybe someone who's gone through the process. <clears throat> I don't know if that means someone like Sarah or someone you know, maybe an applicant who's gone through that process. Yeah, I mean they're they're different different communities. Um, it's it's a it's a range. There's only eight communities that have gone through and done MAPA. Um, there hasn't been a lot. hasn't been a big rush to do it. Um, some big communities that you would have expected, like Burlington, has not gone to MAPA. Um, other communities, Chittenden County communities, have, um, but it hasn't been. A, there hasn't been a big rush to do it. So, but we could certainly find. Um, find someone, whether it's Sarah McShane or whether it's um, somebody else uh, who could come over and give give some some of their experience about it. Okay. Um, does that seem like a good plan for everybody? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we need a vote. I think that's that's yeah, good. Enough. No, I, I mean, I, I, I know from the from the past. I think I don't think I'd be out of place by saying I'm pretty sure John Adams has been a supporter of Mappa. I can't remember where Kirby's been, but I was pretty sure I remember John being a, a supporter of it. Um, okay. So I guess we'll leave it up to you, Mike, to. Get somebody to come in and help us sort through this. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, next up is a summary of zoning updates for housing changes due to statutory changes. So we had um, what was S237 or 235 five or something like that that was approved the legislature um recently actually it was only weeks before election day basically um they finally wrapped up the legislative session and on the last day they passed this housing bill um which made a few requirements um some of them larger requirements um and so because we're working on the zoning change already I incorporated these into it. So when we've got the draft ready, I'll send it out and it, and it should be obvious where these are because um, we're doing the strikeout copy. Um, so one, one change is that the legislature said that for any housing units up, up to four dwelling units, X, um, that would be um, you can no longer use character of the area as a reason to deny an application. So that's a little bit complicated. Um, so let me parse that out. Um, so we break our uses into, you know, 
one, two, three, and four unit. And then after that is multifamily. Anything bigger than four is multifamily. Um, now, character of the area comes in a, during conditional use approval. And that's the only place it really comes into effect is conditional use approval. So um, there are only three requirements in conditional use approval. One is um, character of the area. One is capacity of community facilities. Now, something as small as a one to four unit project um, would never have an impact on traffic pact on the character on the capacity of facilities so it's it's uh, you know somebody putting in a, a four unit building nobody's ever going to say there's not enough fire department capacity to to provide for it so what we made as an assumption was that um because it was very limited it didn't happen in very many places any place where a one, two, three, or four unit on the use table. If it said it was conditional, we're going to make it permitted. Um, so that just makes them administrative because we can't really deny them for conditional use. We might as well just make them permitted uses. And that, so that was one change. Um, does that make sense? Not too confusing. Yep. So you said there were there were three things for conditional use approval: character, capacity, and what was the third one? Traffic. Traffic was the other one. Oh, traffic. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes so, sense. So, so one is just to change the use table, um, and that helps us meet that requirement. The second set of changes were to accessory dwelling units. So they made a few subtle changes, some of which we already, we already had a more generous ADU provision. So some of them we already met. One change that went through was that you can't limit the number of bedrooms anymore. So it used to be that an ADU had to be a studio or one bedroom apartment. Now they said you can't limit the number of bedrooms if it meets the square footage. So if you can put in a, you know, a two bedroom apartment over your garage, that's still an ADU as long as it meets the space requirement of less than 30% or 900 square feet. So there were a couple of little changes like that. Um, I, I put them in there. I don't think they're very um, too controversial, most of which, I, as I said, I think we already, excuse me, we're meeting those requirements. Um, the next one they had were changes to small lots. This will affect us. Although I don't know how, how much. Any, or in, in general, any lot that's less than the minimum lot size. So if we have a lot minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet and you own a 3,000 square foot lot, you have a small lot under state law. Um, and before they used to be treated if it was a um, an undeveloped lot. It, the old rule used to say is if it it's less than 5,000 square feet, then the city has the right or the municipality has the right to prohibit development if that small lot is less than 5,000 square feet. Basically, if it's too small to develop, then you're allowed to prohibit development on small lots. And that was to, to kind of stop some, some gores, um, survey gores or other um, issues that would come up. Um, occasionally, this would come up in places where people bought a double lot, um, you know, especially lakeshore communities or urban communities would have these um, old subdivisions that went through and maybe made 3,000 square foot lots. People would buy up two lots, um, but then later on decide, hey, I've, I've got a separate lot. I can sell it. Well, under, under the old rule, you couldn't. Um, under the new rules... Um, if it's on water and wastewater, then it is still a developable lot. 
so we had to change it. So we're not really sure how that's going to entirely play out. We did talk to David Rue, our city attorney, um, and you know we said, well, does that mean it's exempt from all requirements? You know, like setbacks. And he said, no, it, it's it's developable, but it still has to meet the the requirements. So it still may be undevelopable because it can't meet the setbacks. But we can't deny it simply because it is too small. Um, I think for the most part. We may get some, um, it, it's, it does, it's not going to happen a, a ton, but there may be a lot that's as small as, you know, a thousand square feet that we would simply have to look at as a building lot now. Mike, didn't we already say that any lot, even if it didn't meet the minimum lot size, could be used for a single family dwelling? I thought that was already included. There's something in there about uh, small lots. Yeah, there there was. I'm trying to remember what I would have to go and I'd have to do some search to see if I could find that. Um, I think what that was getting at was that any any conforming lot can always be used at least for a single family dwelling because i think that came up in, in like the steep slopes requirements and these other places where if, if, if the environmental rules were preventing development that we couldn't prohibit all development on that lot as long as it was a sufficient size you think the original as long as it was of sufficient size yeah I can't but this zone. this just meant i had to make a few adjustments to those vested rights rules that are at the start. So the, the, you'll see some changes there. Um, again, I don't think it's a really big deal, but it is a change and I thought I'd give you the update on that. Uh, so the, the second set of changes that we went through, um, Meredith and I and Kevin Casey, the community development specialist who works on the housing with us was um, because we were adjusting some of those housing things on the use table, we had noticed in using the zoning for the past two years that there's some inconsistencies in the use table and how we define them. So there were gaps and spaces where things didn't line up. And you kind of like to have things nested. So that way, you know, for example, it's one unit, two, three, four, and if it's more than four, then it's multifamily. Well, it's nice and clean. You know exactly where you fit on that spectrum. But sometimes you have things that don't fit into a box, like having senior housing as a separate use. And you start trying to figure out whether senior housing, you know, isn't senior housing just an apartment building or, um, you know, so we had some uses that didn't quite fit in. They kind of just kind of plunked in there. And so we went through and cleaned up that that use table a little bit. So that way it was a little bit cleaner and we broke them into three groups. So you have your dwelling units, which I just discussed. There would be a second group, which we would just call congregate housing. And congregate housing is gonna be any use that um, doesn't have all of the independent living requirements. So for example, um, a dwelling unit has to have its own kitchen, its own bedroom, its own living, and its own sanitation. Every unit is a contained unit that has all of the required elements. Uh, congregate living doesn't necessarily have that. They may share some or all of those. Um, you may, in um, we used to have a separate use for rooming and boarding house. Um, so you might, in a rooming and boarding house, rent a room, but share a bathroom and share a kitchen. Um, you might live in a dormitory. A dormitory is a congregate living where you you live in a room and meals are provided to you and you share sanitation facilities. Um, so we we left it as a congregate living as, as a more general grouping because we feel there's a lot of other alternative living arrangements that just simply may fall into that. Um, there's some co-housing, um, uh, commune uh, type arrangements that people could come up with. And, and rather than try to define each one, we just said, look, if, if everybody gets their own dwelling unit, then you're a dwelling unit. 
And if people are living in a different living arrangement where you're sharing these things, then you're going to be congregate living. And we made them mostly conditional uses because we're really leaving it broad and we don't know how that's going to um, look. So we really felt like it would be appropriate to leave it broad um, and give the DRB discretion to approve and not approve based on, you know, mostly in this case, probably the character of the area. Um, because you can, for these congregate living arrangements, you know, make a determination of whether, you know, living in dormitories is appropriate. It might make sense in, you know, up at VCFA, it might not make sense in a different area. Um, but the idea is we would just break into that. And then the third group are the, the, the state. So we have the dwelling units, the congregate living, and the third group are the state licensed and registered facilities. Um, and they're very specific uses. They're, they're easy to distinguish because you need a state license for, and they may be either dwelling units or congregate living. Um, they're, they're arranged either way. Um, some um, residential care facilities um, might be very much in assisted living where there's um, meals are provided and um, and in other cases, it may be um, more of a senior housing situation where um, only certain facilities are, are shared. So um, we left it, we left those as our own groups because they can flex either way between, between the two, but we have to treat them differently because they're licensed. So, and I think that was about it. Oh, except for um, one other change which I think John would be happy for or if he were here, but he's not. Um, we discussed in the definition of dwelling unit, we had inserted that dwelling units had to at least be 250 square feet in size. And we decided we would recommend striking that requirement because what that did was that made, it made it illegal to do tiny homes. And so either we were going to have to make tiny homes their own use um, or we were going to have to find some other way of managing them. And knowing that that concept is out there and knowing that that may come up from time to time that we should, if we just remove the 250 square foot minimum, then a tiny home is no different than any other home. As long as it contains the, the five required elements of a, of a dwelling unit, then it's a dwelling unit. If you can fit all five of those into 150 square feet or 100 square feet, then go for it. We just have to see that you've got, you know, wastewater, um, living, cooking, sleeping, um, and something else. There's five, five of them that are in the definition of a dwelling unit. So as long as you can meet that, go, go for it. Well, now you've piqued my curiosity, Mike. I need to know what the fifth, the fifth. <laughs> you said wastewater. Is it just regular water, water access? All right. So you're gonna make me look it up. No, you you don't have to look it up, Mike. I was just teasing you. <laughs> I'm, okay. not, I'm not looking to build a tiny house right now. So uh, living, sleeping, eating. Well, I guess I have eating and cooking as separate that's why i didn't get it eating cooking and sanitation living sleeping eating cooking and sanitation so you don't need electricity apparently not well i'm i'm, I'm legitimately surprised by that if you can do that uh, well it's not a minimum for rental housing rental housing code is going to put you at a higher level yeah um, so if you wanted to rent that unit, then you must meet, um, which we don't enforce the rental code through the zoning. Um, rental code is, uh, is kind of vaguely unenforced and sitting on state law right now. Um, but there's a proposal to have division of fire safety take that over. So I'll be interested to see how that goes. Um, and so we'll see. Interesting. Okay, with that, uh, moving right along, we are now at our eighth agenda item, the presentation of capital improvement plan for informational and educational background. 
All right, so I sent out um, the the Excel file. You know, I didn't bother trying to PDF it or anything. I just figured I would send it out. Um, there was some conversation last time when we were talking about the transportation plan about what is a CIP, how does it work, um, and I guess I can, if people want, I can try to share my screen again, see if I can pull that up. Um, so this is our current draft CIP. Um, and what you see is, um, th this is all proposed at this point, but the concepts are there. So in, in this case, equipment, um, you know, uh, these are a little bit more general. Um, sometimes you're much more specific about what the equipment is. I don't know what's under DPW equipment. Ah, so that's, there's the way DPW um, breaks down their equipment. So you've got bucket loaders, trucks, F-150s, the date purchased, the life expectancy. So what you can do once you've plugged all these factors in, and if you plug in a cost, what it can do is you know that if you've got a life expectancy of a bucket loader for 15 years, you can place out where this is going to be. And I don't know how far out this goes. This only goes out to 2028. So what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. So it's a current year plus seven years. Um, they can be out as long as you want to make them. I've done them for communities out to, to 11 years. And the idea is that you would be able to put in, in the purchase date in the life expectancy and know that 15, 13 plus 15 is going to be 2028 is when we should be looking at um, purchasing a new bucket loader, for example. Um, and this goes right on through. You would simply put each one of these different um, wing trucks, plow trucks, sweepers, and, and you factor them in and you put in how much it costs for them. And then you've got two ways that you can pay for that equipment. One of which is to uh, amortize it and put that money away. Um, so you might do that if you had a sale, um, a, a large ladder truck or, or something that's really expensive for a fire department or you might have to bond for some of those, but the idea is that you can start thinking ahead and spacing out, um, you know, you, you hope you get to a point where you can space them out. Well, um, you know, if your plow trucks are good for 10 years and you own 10 plow trucks and we might as well just buy one a year and be on a good replacement schedule. Um, and, and it gets more in depth than that. Um, uh, I, I know working with, different DPW garage guys, they, they factor everything in to make sure that they are looking at the resale value, for example. Um, you know, a lot of there, were, I've heard complaints from counselors sometimes about, well, well, why do we have all these new trucks? Why don't we just drive the old trucks and keep driving them? And sometimes it comes down to resale value. They, they price the economics of, well, we're going to buy it at 150,000. And if we trade it in at, at eight years, then, then that's our best resale value. We can trade that in, get good trade in on a new truck. And then we don't have to pay people to fix trucks. Um, otherwise you've got to have hired mechanics to keep your trucks going. So it, it's a balancing act that they factor in. The idea of the capital plan, as I said, is really to look, in this case, equipment. What are our big capital purchases and how much is it going to cost for us to do? And what's our total total cost? And you can see they're, they're looking at this year, COVID, we had to zero out most of the equipment fund. So rather than spending $300,000 on equipment this year, we only spent $45,000. So now we've got to push all of those other purchases later. Um, so that's just an example um, of the equipment. And let me back up to the summary sheet here. The other one we were talking about as it applies to transportation was um, 
paving, and I think that's what this is here. This is our streets total for our paving. Current streets, bridges, transportation, retaining walls, sidewalks. So yes. So this is the paving schedule. What's getting paved? How much is it going to cost? Um, 120,000 for Clarendon, 140 for Deerfield. These were actually last year's 2020. So these were projects that if you live on those streets, you probably saw were done. And this is approximately what it costs to do them. Um, this is the 2021 plan and the, what we would be looking at budgeting for next year. And again, they're looking at all of the streets and all of the different projects we might have to do and trying to make sure that we meet the um, the paving schedule, streets will be paved um, on average. It depends on how, how busy the road is, how much traffic they get, but we'll just put it in there 12 to 15 years. Um, could be sooner, could be, could take longer. You know, a, a small back road that doesn't get much traffic may last longer. It really depends on how good the road base is, but they budget in how much it's going to cost to replace replace those roads so that way they can get again this this sum total of projects we will spend five hundred thousand dollars a year paving streets approximately what bridges have to get done these are always very expensive projects these are the the five bridges including rialto bridge this is one we've talked about a lot for why we want to have state street ready to go and that's a seven hundred thousand dollar project for, for replacing that bridge in 2024. Um, other projects in the transportation um, street lights the very main intersection retaining walls um, being the city of hills we have a lot of retaining walls. Uh, again, they, they have identified what are the projects and when we're going to do them out 2024. And they probably on a separate sheet have much out much farther than 2024. Um, so again, the sidewalks that we're going to replace, we're spending 285,000 on, on sidewalks in this year. Um, and varying amounts, 90, 160, 215 stormwater improvements cemetery improvements, buildings and grounds, things that are happening going on. Um, so again, this pulls everything together that uh, the CIP, our, our capital improvement plan, when you add everything up uh, is, is a considerable amount of money that we spent 1.7 million last year, 1.3 million this year, 2 million next year, 1.8, 2.5. So it, it gives you an idea um, when we talk about how to implement our transportation plan, and most of these are transportation related, not all of them. Um, you know, this is buildings and grounds isn't really um, part of transportation, but a lot of these other pieces are, um, that's, that's an important piece. How we implement our transportation plan, a lot of it comes down to how do we spend our $2 million this year um, or 1.5 million. Um, and how do we lay out these projects going forward? And are we putting enough money in? That was part of the paving schedule. If anyone was remembering back eight years, um, seven, eight years ago now, there was a, a, a big issue with how bad the streets were in Montpelier because they hadn't been, in, nobody had been putting enough money into paving. And so every time we had a budget shortfall, the first thing that would get cut is paving and it would never come back. So they made an, an effort that every year they would add another 200,000 into the paving budget to get it up to um, a much higher amount. I wanna say 800,000 a year. Where was streets? Yeah, it was to get up that 600, 700,000 a year, I think was where we were trying to get up to. Um, this year will be an anomaly because it's COVID, but that's that's a little bit of what they're trying to do is to make sure we you know by looking at a sustainable you know how much money do we need to sustainably manage our streets how much money do we need to sustainably replace our equipment um and you put all that together into a big capital plan and um you know um uh, you know uh, your your budget geeks love this stuff it's you know put all on the tables and you you can 
can figure out exactly how much money you need and how much money we need to raise and where can we get grants to trust some of those costs um, and go from there. So I guess I'll take some questions. So Mike, um, I assume a lot of these are connected. So if the storm water replace is being replaced on a certain street, then that's also going to get sidewalk work and street work in the same year? If you were to look through, you may find that. Or what you may find is the stormwater happens a year before. If you, if you were to pay attention, I, I get to see it a lot because I have a nice long commute. Um, but if you ever watch the state, um, you'll see See, the state will go through in one year and they will go through and replace culverts and they may replace some bridges and then they may do some ditching. And then finally, like three, the, the, the fourth year out, they'll go through and repave everything. Um, and it's really because they're starting at the, the bottom and working their way up because they don't want to go through and repave a street and then have a culvert fail. So they'll go through in one year and replace all the culverts on that same road. And the roads are terrible still. And then they go through the next year and they work on something else and the roads are still terrible. And then finally they reach a point where they go through and they pave everything. And, and, and it's part of their CIP that in, in, at the state level that they'll go through and determine what happens. And um, you probably would find if there was a gap in a sidewalk, um, and actually it's nice that, that it's actually highlighted here, um, East State Street, um, needs a retaining wall. Um, East State Street needs a sidewalk. And I'm surprised I don't see the numbers lining up, but I would have mm -hmm. expected, because this is a project that's coming up, that I would have expected this East State Street would have popped up in, in all three, because I think it's, it's a stormwater pro project, a retaining wall project, and a street project but maybe they lumped some of them together. Oh, there it is. It's, it's up here for 2024 for 275. Mm -hmm. And it's a retaining wall project. Maybe they put that separately somewhere and it's a sidewalk for 150. So you see the sidewalk and the street paving are being done on the same, in the same year at the same time. Okay. I thought that was coming up sooner, but maybe they're doing the right of way and acquisition because some of these projects like East State Street's a big project. And if you don't own the right of ways, you sometimes need to go through and, and purchase um, or go through takings process or something. If, if you don't, you know, not all places have uniform um, things and sometimes you need to go by and, and pick up something. So. Um, getting the surveys and the planning done for a big project like this, you might have to do $50,000 worth of work here in order to get the permits ready here in order to build the projects here. And one more quick question under buildings and grounds. Um, the Energy Committee was actually asking about this because we didn't know if that was included in this uh, CIP. Um, what is building slash land for 254000 in FY? 2021. How does that break down? I don't know. I don't know what that is. Do, it must I mean, be a very it, specific project that that's that's out there. Does it break break out in your spreadsheet or not? The 254. No, I don't. I don't see that it's broken out, so I don't mm -hmm. know what what that figure is. Well, okay. Looks like we're either buying something I, or building something, but it was originally slated for this fiscal year, right? We are in twenty twenty one. 
Yes, we are in 2021. Okay. Well, that's a question. I know they did a roof. I know they did the roof on City Hall, but I would have expected that in City Hall. But yeah, I don't know. But yeah, like I said, the big key to this is it's this this is this is a tool. Um, you know, a lot of times how we spend our money is a very critical tool in how we implement our city plan, how we get our goals accomplished. Um, so we, we talk a lot about um, regulations and policies and sometimes planners get stuck in that world and we miss the fact that um, so much work gets done through the CIP and, um, and making sure that we participate in that is the right way to make sure that our stormwater goals are met um, and that our, uh, our complete streets goals are met. Um, you know, are we prioritizing? And I think this goes to when the transportation committee talks about wanting to be on equal footing with alternative transportation and automobiles, um, you know, and, 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 you know, you, you certainly have a point when you look at this and go and say that, you know, you know, our, our paving and these other budgets are, are $600,000 and down here, our sidewalks are $100,000. Um, you know, are, are we getting equal footing? Now it is more expensive to, to pave a 24 foot road than it is to build a six foot sidewalk. So, um, but are, are, we, are we prioritizing these activities down here um, to make sure that our goals are gonna be accomplished within our time span? You know, is this, is this good enough? Mike, is this the current proposal? It's going to city council or I mean, they review this, right? Yeah, this was, this was just a draft. I was trying to get a copy of last year's cause I didn't want to confuse people with an influx one, but the only one that I had, e this was emailed to me from the finance department as to all, it was emailed to all department heads as the primer for the budget Congress, where we talked about developing the FY 22 budget. And so this, this is not by any means, um, the, the, this was just an, a draft that was in the, in the works. Um, some of which is capturing the adjustments that were made to 2021. And some of them were, how are we going to meet our goals of 2022? And it may certainly have been that in the budget discussion, we had to cut a hundred thousand dollars out of the budget, in which case people would have to go through and figure out what, where are we pulling a hundred thousand dollars out of here? So this, this is by no means the, the proposal. Um, it was just a draft that was out there and it was, it's meant to really be just kind of educational to kind of show people what one looks like. And in fact, this is ours and, and reflects a number of years and, you know, um, hopefully people, you know, and, and it affects not only just transportation, but all departments. I mean, fire and EMS, you know, they've got capital needs, whether it's buying ambulances or improving and, and building equipment. Um, this could be the parks department, you know, it's a smaller capital fund, but they've got um, equipment that they need to maintain the cemetery uh, at the same time. They've, they've got trucks and equipment they need um, and, and, uh, technology. So even things that you, you wouldn't think of, you know, your servers and your con contracts and computers to keep the city's IT department running. Um, recreation may need to fix a swimming pool or some of their uh, equipment outside. So, um, and of course, that's the police department equipment. They've got big needs. Um, so this is just meant to be an example. But if, if you want the version when the finance department and, and, and the budget goes to 
council. I think the budget is supposed to go to council in December. So if it goes to council, you should be able to get a copy of what is the capital budget that is being proposed. So give it a couple weeks. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. That was informative. <laughs> um, does anybody have anything else they want to discuss? Okay. Hearing nothing else, uh, I'd ask for, uh, without any objection, I would uh, suggest we adjourn. Here I'm moved. Is. Moved it is. Seconded. Barb gives the hand wave. <laughs> All in favor. I I'll even unmute. <laughs> All those opposed. Nobody opposed. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. The Thanks. Barb, I'll get back to you soon at that email. Thank you for sending it. Okay, sure. That's Great. fine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.